Um, our very own, our pastor, the prophet, Moses Anderson. Hallelujah. Thank you, Alan. Praise the Lord. God is good. All righty, all righty, all righty. Praise God. God is good. Antoine, do you mind taking that down for me, please? Okay. Praise the Lord, everybody. God is good. Awesome. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to have a name ring and register in our spirits before we sit down. So come with me to Matthew chapter 1 verse 7. And the Bible says here in Matthew chapter 1 verse 7 that Solomon begot Rehoboam and Rehoboam begot Abijah and Abijah begot Asa. I just want that name Solomon let it, just, let it just fester in your heart. And we're going to talk more about it, hopefully, in the next couple of minutes. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you because we have come to the company of innumerable angels. We have come to the assembly of just men made perfect. We have come around your throne of grace where we obtain mercy and grace to help in time of need. Father, we have come to the place wherein ordinarily we should have been struck, but we are embraced because of the blood of the lamb. And so we're thankful because we will continue in gratitude by faith and with openness of heart, continue to draw from the fountain of life that is in here in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's all be seated. Let's be seated. Let us be seated. Praise the Lord. God is good. God is good. I know that I have shared this with us before, but I'm going to just quickly touch on a few things real quick as a way of getting us started. And, um, and also, very quickly, there is the need for us to just touch on one or two things that my wife said while she was here. And I want to take us to the book of Isaiah real quick and then show us one or two things there about the presence of God. Alrighty, so let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 19 real quick. Uh, one of the things that struck me as my wife was speaking there earlier was the mention and the reference to the story of Oza or Uza, the gentleman who was trying to secure the Ark of the Covenant uh, from falling. Uh, Miss Josephine, if you don't mind the talk, and I have one of the tissue... Uh, boxes right next to you. I just need one piece from there. Um, I think I must have gotten a bit too excited. Thank you during that worship. So whether it is sweat or tears, I don't know what it is, but my glasses aren't working as they should. I'm still waiting for someone to invent glasses that have wipers on them. I may just, uh, just smile in a certain way. I should just go ahead and invent it. All righty. Well, okay. The onus is on me now. Yeah. Let's see what happens. Yeah. If the Lord delays is coming, who knows what kind of things we're going to be inventing. And it's interesting that we're speaking about inventions because while the worship was on and I was in the spirit, I saw what our cities should have been like. I'm talking about if our cities were actually built for us. Because a lot of the cities that we have, even though it appears as though we live in them, they are built not necessarily for us, the people who use the streets all the time, but they are mostly built for the ones that benefit from us using the streets. And you know, back in the day when you talk like that, they called you a conspiracy theorist. But thank God, this is 2023. People are beginning to wake up to the fact that what the Lord said prophetically to us about the times that we're in is the truth and not what people have been telling us. You know, when the Lord says that he is coming as our kinsman redeemer to redeem us. You know, if you live here in the West, on some occasions, you may even wonder, do we need redemption? We're doing just fine. We have running water. We have electricity. 
city. You can just go to the grocery store. You can choose what kind of whatever kind of diet you want. You want to be vegan. You want to be vegetarian. Everything is abundant because we live in the land of plenty. And so some days you just feel like, you know, especially if you can go back to the 90s. In the 90s, wherein your kids can leave the house all day and be riding their bicycles around and you don't have to worry about them. You know, if you could go back to such times wherein, you know, seemingly speaking, everything was working and there was peace, you would wonder why do we need redemption? But we need redemption because we are in the land of captivity. And I'm not just talking about the countries that we hail from or the countries that we live in. I'm talking again about the system that is called Babylon. I'm talking about this system of mammon that seeks to get the best of us in exchange for money that perishes while we give away the real goods, the true value of our existence, the precious things of our soul. Many of us trade the righteousness, the peace, and the joy of the Holy Spirit just for a change, just for a little bit of convenience. And that is because the system is engineered to make us believe that that is how things should be. And so while worship was going on, I caught a glimpse of what the streets should look like and there was a piece of technology that I saw that existed just to make your traverse or your, your what's the word, your stroll, your evening stroll even more enjoyable. You see, at the end of the day, we need to be reminded that when God made man, he put man in a garden. And now, most of us have to work for 50 weeks in a year just to be able to spend one week of relaxation. It's completely upside down. You understand what I mean? You see, I remember the story that was told by an American businessman who had been on vacation. He took his son, and you all probably know this story because every story now is on social media, so if I'm not telling it right, you can correct me. But he went on vacation and he was in a small fishing town and he saw a fisherman show up and just fish for a couple of hours, maybe two, three hours, and went away with his son. And he did that for like two, three days, back to back. And so the rich man said to him, he said, you know that I'm a businessman. I'm an investor. I know how to create businesses. I can help you scale up this little business that you're doing because it looks like you only come in here to have enough catch for you and your little family. He said, you know, you can actually increase the size of your boat. We can help you raise some money. You buy a bigger boat. And he kept on describing all of what could happen. And the fisherman listened and he said, so to what end? He said, so that you, you can have enough money to be able to just do what I'm doing in here, to just come and sit by the river without having to do anything. And he says, but you only just got here a couple of days ago and you're going to leave in a few days. He says, but I'm here all the time. You see, it doesn't occur to many of us that a lot of what we are striving to attain for just a couple of days in the year is what God intended for us to enjoy every single day of our lives. But we have been sold on this idea of do all of what you can, do all of that, sell your soul, lose your peace, break a sweat, grow old, develop wrinkles so that one day you can rest. And I'm like, wow, I've seen that in a lot of people and I don't envy that approach at all. Many people slave away the best of their years and when they turn 72, they attempt to buy a Ferrari and the moment it goes more than 30 miles an hour, they start sweating. Their blood pressure goes up. And I'm like, it's too late. You missed your chance, my friend. You don't have to have bought a Ferrari. You could have just bought yourself. Oh, I'm not going to mention anybody's car so they don't wait for me at the door. But you could have bought something you can afford while you could afford to actually enjoy it. So we need more inventions. And by the grace of God, we will have an opportunity to do it. Isaiah chapter 19. Isaiah 19, and by the grace of God, I'm not going to dwell on this subject because I've taught around it before, but I want you to see the significance of what my wife was saying earlier. I just believe that that word needs to be emphasized a little bit more. And um, Isaiah 19, Katrina, good to see you. Good to see you, good to see you, good to see you. And now verse 19 says, in that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. A pillar to the Lord at its borders. Isaiah 19, 19. Isaiah chapter 19, verse 19. The Bible says, In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. 
and a pillar to the Lord at its border. And it will be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors. And he will send them a savior and a mighty one and he will deliver them. You know what's interesting about this altar that is in the land of Egypt is that it has become a monument that people pay money to go and look at today thinking about how amusing it is, how fascinating it is, how much of a mystery it is, without majority of people knowing the reason why it was put there. Many, for many years, they tried to tell us that those pyramids in Egypt, particularly the Pyramid of Giza, was there as a burial, as so, sort of like a, a what you might call a mausoleum. They said it's a burial place. How come we never found dead bodies in there? The mummies were elsewhere. Okay, tell us another lie, we're listening. And they told us all kinds of things. But when you look at the description of what is here, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that the Lord God commanded for there to be an altar in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the Lord at its border. Now, have you ever thought about this scripture and thought about the fact that, wait a minute, what is God really saying? Do you want a pillar in the middle or do you want it at the border? Because it's very difficult for something to be at the center. And at the same time, it's at the edge. That's what the Bible says. The Lord commanded it for it to be in the midst of the land, but also for the same pillar to be at the border. And for a very long time, I didn't know what this meant. Until recently. And what it means is exactly what's been standing in front of us the entire time. And what is that? The land of Egypt is broken into two. You have the upper Egypt and you have the lower Egypt. When you look at the border of the upper Egypt and the border of the lower Egypt, it gives you the center of combined Egypt. Does that make sense? So it's like, it's like having two squares. If I choose the middle of one of the squares, it takes me too far away from the second square. But if I put it at the border of each of them, guess what happens? I am dead in the middle of the two volumes. Now, the reason why that is important is when you look at the Pyramid of Giza, where is it? It is right there at the border of the lower and the border of the northern. It is in the midst of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said, let's look at what the Lord said again concerning that pillar. If I, let, me, let me read it from here one more time and then we'll, we'll move on from it. The Bible says, and it will be a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. Why was it made that big? Why was it made of stones the way that it was constructed? For God wanted it to be a sign from generation to generation. People have always wondered, we don't understand the technology behind it. We don't know how it was built. I know how it was built. It was built by the word of God. When God says, let it be done, it gets done. No matter what technology gets required, would have to be manufactured or sent from heaven. One way or the other, God cannot be denied. And God said that I want to sit here and be able to see it from where I'm at. We have studied the pyramid and we know that the position of the pyramid is almost in the center. They said that it is in the center of the entire land mass of the earth to about 0 0.03 degrees of accuracy. And the reason why it's not zero zero dead on the mark is because those people don't know the math of heaven. If they know the kind of math that God operates by, they will find out that it is right in the middle. It is sitting right there under the north star where the Bible says the throne of God is. The Bible says God sits above the circle of the earth. He sits dead center above the earth with his eye running to and fro. So we know that the reason why God asked him to be placed there is so that he doesn't have to look for it to see it. It is always before him as a memorial. One day when I was discussing this, um, I was meditating on this and discussing with the Holy Spirit concerning this sign, he said to me, he said, for the one that is above, his sign has to be below. Just as you below, your signs are where? 
Your signs are above. The Bible says he has put stars that the Lord God Almighty placed stars in the firmament of the heavens so that they can be for signs and for seasons. God expects you to look up because he is looking down so that y'all can meet in the middle. Because God cannot look up. There's nothing above God. So he's looking to us so that we can learn from him to look to him. And see, the way God has done it in such a way, the way God has done it is this. He did it in such a way that we will be without excuse. The altar that the Lord set up, that the Lord commanded to be set up as a memorial was set up so that every single day, no matter what happens, you can drop atomic bombs. There can be a flood. There can be fire. There can be all those things, but the pillar will remain. Let me say that again very slowly. Ryan, good to see you. Praise the Lord. Miss Vanessa, good to see you too. That is Shayla's mom, everybody. If in case you're wondering why she looks familiar, she's Shayla's mom. Good to see you. Thanks for, thanks for joining us today. So I'm of the opinion. In fact, it's not my opinion. This is something that I have come to know as the Lord has instructed me. That when God said to us in Romans chapter 1 verse 20, that from the visible elements of this world, we have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God and of eternity, which he has made available since the dawn of time in all that we see that we may be without excuse. The Bible says everything is so that you are without excuse. So the tabernacle in the wilderness was created so that we can see something visible that allows us to understand the invisible. Because some people say that shouting and dancing is an Old Testament thing because everything they did was physical. Some people don't clap and dance when they come to church. They don't shout because they're like, well, David and Obed-Edom, they did all of that because the Ark of the Covenant was physically present with them. But the reality of it is this. God already told us how to induce his presence. We can evoke the presence of God by praise. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. Do you know that that same Ark of the Covenant was with the Philistines and they did not have the presence of God? So the presence of God that, was, that the Ark represented was just a sign, something for people to see so that they can learn how to operate consistently with the unseen. And God said, set up an altar. As long as I am seeing that altar, you're guaranteed that your salvation will not be denied. We have just read that in Isaiah chapter 19. God says, and I'm going to read it to you again. And the Bible says that the Lord God, and, and verse 20, and it will be for a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a mighty one who will deliver them. God is saying, as long as I am seeing that pyramid, I will keep my word. There's no way I'm going to forget you. That thing is too big for me to ignore. You know, they tell us fancy things like, oh, it's one of the only few things on earth that is visible from space. There's a reason why it's visible from outside the earth. Simply because the one who commanded for it to be put there, put it there for that same reason. Now, let me tell you something. Alan came up after my wife and he says, oh, the woman of God was trying to, you know, elaborate on the significance of altars. And then he also moved on. The reason why altars are important is because when you make a demand on heaven, there needs to be a meeting place. Because of the fact that the presence of God as much as we say that God is omnipresent, that he is everywhere, the manifest presence of God that brings tangible power to address specific situations requires a meeting place all the time. There needs to be an altar. When Jacob had an experience with God, what did he do? He was like, I'm going to mark this place. Because if he's met with me here, he can meet with me here again. He, put, he set up a pillar and called the name of the place Bethel because the Lord visited him there. Now, if I know where God is, you know, sometimes we feel so all alone. Sometimes we desperately need to get the attention of God. If God were a man, 
who lives in Lawrenceville. You would want to know his address. Even if you have to fill a form and scream and shout from the gate, you will go there. Although some people are like, <laughs> because of what I did last night, I'm not going to go near where God is. But the reality of it is there's never any reason why we shouldn't go to God because the mercy for what you think will disqualify you from his presence is also available only in his presence. God, in his manifold wisdom, orchestrated the things of our necessity to only be possible via his presence. Because you know he's a father. And he knows that if you don't need him, sometimes you will not come. For those of us who have children, we know how that works. The reason why you still see your little 12 year old every day is because they need you because they can't afford to pay for their own rent. They can't afford to pay for anything. Sometimes they don't want to see your face, but when they think about all the things they need you for, they will show up. You know, sometimes my son laughs at my jokes and I'll be like, wow, Joshua, what do you want? Because I know the kind of sense of humor that he has my jokes aren't always funny to him. You know, he has his own kind of genre of jokes that he's into. I'm into all kinds of dangerous kinds of genres like the cannibal jokes and all whatnot. So sorry, they call them dad jokes now. Yeah, let's not scare anybody. You see, but then when he starts laughing and giggling excessively, I'm like, Joshua, that is not even that funny to me. As wacky as my sense of humor is, I can tell you want something. And he'll be like, well, actually, I've been trying to get your attention and I was hoping. I'm like, yeah. There is something. Because I know that if he had a million dollars in his account, he would not have laughed at that joke. He may not even be present to hear that joke. I would be the one calling him and say, hey, Joshua, it's been a minute. Like, Dad, I'm really busy. I have this meeting in Tokyo. I have this. How do I know that? Because I do that to my parents. My mom sent me a text message on Thursday. And when I saw the text message, I'm like, why such a long message? I still spoke to you on Sunday. So I called my mom. And she was like, wow, hello, stranger. I'm like, mom, I still spoke to you on Sunday. She was like, you know, Sunday is four days ago. And I'm thinking to myself, in my world, that's like four hours ago. You understand what I mean? But when I was a little child, I couldn't go for 40 minutes at times without seeing my mom. Because it's either I'm hungry, or I need her to take me somewhere, or I just need to know that she's there. So that I can promise my friends all kinds of things. You understand what I mean? Because I can't pick up the landline and tell somebody, oh, I'm going to join you guys for the play date when I don't drive. So it was important. The presence of my parents was so important because of the fact that they pretty much run everything that I needed. And God does the same thing because he doesn't want us to live or attempt to live without him. So he put everything that we need in his presence. Because it's like one day Antoine will come to his senses and come here. That is how it deals with us. Can you think about anything that you need that is not in the presence of God? Someone says, I can just go to the store and buy myself an apple. But do you know that you need appetite and good health to even eat that apple? You understand what I mean? And in these days that fruits are sprayed with all kinds of things, you need confidence in Jesus to actually just go out and buy something that you did not grow and eat it and expect to be well. When the Bible says... <laughs> that the wicked are out to annihilate the, the righteous. You just never know what someone is attempting to do. So that is the reason why everything that you need is in the water. And so when you think like that, then the presence of God begins to make more sense to you. It becomes more attractive to you, not just because it's a beautiful thing, but it's also because it's a needed thing. You know, I keep telling you the story of David. You know, David danced and he shouted and he did all of those things. Even though we think about David as an Old Testament king, the reality of it was David was a New Testament believer. The reason why he enjoyed all of what he enjoyed was because he had a revelation of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and he tapped into it. Do you know that the things Jesus was saying on the cross, David wrote it about a thousand years before Jesus came? Because David lived ex almost exactly 998 years before Jesus came. About a thousand years. And he already wrote those things down. When Jesus was on the cross and he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, why have you forsaken me? David wrote it. 
David saw Jesus crucified. That was why when he saw that the soldiers brought him down and they didn't break his bones, he was excited. He says, my, he said, my, he says the Lord will not allow his Holy One to see corruption. Neither will he allow his bones to be broken. So he knew what he was doing because he had already seen. He was a time traveler. And David asked God, he says, Father, I want to be born again. In Psalms 51, he went to God. He says, create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit within me. This man of God was a born again believer 1,000 years before it became possible. David understood the principle of believing unto righteousness and confessing unto salvation. He says, I believe, therefore I speak. He didn't just believe unto righteousness. He also confessed with his mouth unto salvation. And he tapped into the joy of the Holy Spirit when he said, do not take away from me the joy of salvation. Because he knew that the Holy Spirit was the joy of salvation. The reason why many people are born again but they're not enjoying is because they got born again but they're not receiving or, or exercising the privilege of having the Holy Spirit. Whereas the Bible lets us know, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, the Bible says, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Father God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. If the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is not involved in your relationship with God, it can't be sweet. It feels like bondage. Romans chapter 8 verse 15, the Bible says, For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Once David was afraid of God's presence, but then he snapped out of it. My wife read the story to us. When David saw that Uzzah was killed because he touched the presence, the, the Ark of the Covenant, he thought to himself, he said, I'm not going to bring this home with me because I know what I'm doing at home. So let us find somebody here. And they found Obed-Edom. And the Bible says he was a faithful man. The word Obed-Edom means the one who faithfully serves other people. Obed means to faithfully serve. Edom is another, is, is a, in a way a bastardization of the vernacular of the name Adam. Adam was what eventually became Edom, which means man. And so they said, this one is a faithful one. God's presence can be in his house because we know that he's a good guy. You understand what I mean? But what did David realize? David realized after a while, now wait a minute. He says, why would I let somebody be enjoying all of that goodness of God? And I am here. After like three months, he was like, let's give this thing a go. Whatever happens, let it happen. But I know it's going to be good. Many of us, we are just like that. Every now and again, we are like, man, I am to this to praise. I am to this to, to, to give thanks to God. Maybe when this happens, I'm going to give thanks to God. Do you not know that it is when you give thanks to God that those things will begin to happen? So David was like, at first he was thinking that he needed to be righteous before he got the ark to his house. But then he realized quickly that it is that same presence of God that brings liberty. Because the Bible says in the presence of God, there is what? There is liberty. So all of the things that entangled him, he realized that he will continue to be in an entanglement until he brings the presence of God to break the shackles. I think it's time for Mary Mary to remix their song. You know, they sang the song, take the shackles off my feet so I can dance. And God was like, no, you dance and the shackles will fall off. Because in, in the Bible, there was nobody who waited until their shackles fell off before the praise God. Paul and Silas were put in shackles and put in prison. And they praised and they sang. The Bible says Paul and Silas, they prayed, they sang, and the Holy Ghost came down when they praised God and created the atmosphere of his presence because they cannot be bondage in the presence of God because the Bible says in that presence there is liberty. There cannot be lack in the presence of God because the Bible says in the presence of God there is fullness of joy. Do you know what fullness of joy means? What it means is that your joy cannot be made full until you are in his presence. So let's go back to the same principle that God instituted. He said, I want that altar because that is my sign. Every time I look at that altar, I know exactly where to take salvation to. I need to take salvation to Egypt. 
What is the name of salvation? Jesus. He says, out of Egypt, I have called my son. The reason why they had to experience deliverance in Egypt in the time of Pharaoh is because Jesus was going to be in Egypt as well. And from Egypt, it will be presented to the world. You understand what I mean? And so what is that telling us? God is letting us know that that sign represents eternal commitment to your deliverance. And Jesus is the eternal commitment to your deliverance because even before the world was formed, the Bible says, behold the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundations of the earth. And we are also told that his spirit will be our seal, not just unto the day of redemption, but for as long as he will be with us. And how long is he going to be with us? He says, I will be with you forever. And so I want to encourage you, do what God has done. He has set up for himself a perpetual reminder of his commitment to you, so you also need to set up a perpetual altar, a point of activation, so that when that blessing comes, when the angels are dispatched because God is fully committed, they know exactly where to go. I've said this with you before, but I'm going to say it again because it's one of the reasons why we need to praise God all the time. You see, when Satan was driven out of heaven, the Bible says his place was no more. Himself and a third of the angels. And so they've been stuck here. And guess what? They've tasted the presence of God. Lucifer was called the angel of the presence because his wings spans over the throne of God. And so these guys have tasted the beauty of his presence. And that is the reason why they've been going to and fro, looking for the closest thing to that presence that they can get their sustenance, the air that they are used to breathing, the water that they are used to seeing, every single one of those things, they have been deprived of it. And that is the reason why the presence of God on earth is not as common as you would want it to be because there are forces waiting to abuse it if it shows up unmanaged. And that is the reason why you need to know how to open the portal to the presence of God for your own sake. And you do that through the art of praising God. You know, many a times I tell people, and I still told you about a month ago, that when the Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord, it is not an Old Testament thing. The Bible did not say make a joyful noise. In the New Testament, people still praised God by screaming and shouting till they lost their voices. So let's not be too sophisticated for God. And what happened to Obed-Edom was that he took that ark home. And David went and took it and took it home out of the mouth, mouth of two or three witnesses. So whatever you experience here when we're praising God, you need to learn how to take it home. Because if you only praise God on Tuesdays and on Saturdays, well, we will see some progress. But there is nothing like making it a perpetual altar before the Lord. Do you know that God frowns at altars of bricks? Why? There was a time some people were building an altar and God came again in his usual fashion. He was like, he was talking to the angels of the presence. He said to them, he says, uh, have you seen what these guys are doing? They said, uh-huh. He says, they are building an altar using bricks instead of stone. When, when was the last time he said that? Or the, one, the first time we heard him say that? Genesis 11, when they were building the Tower of Babel. First of all, <laughs> you know, sometimes we do this thing which God does without even knowing it. Someone, something is happening that is very drastic. Something is very terrible. It's like you're watching a newscaster telling something terrible in the news and your concern is that his tie does not match his shirt. Okay, maybe that is too extreme. Sometimes my wife is talking to me about something that I need to do that I haven't done and I am busy focusing on the new hair she just did. And I'm like, well, I like that hair. She's like, look, look at me and listen to me. And I would say, I'm like my father God. Sometimes we kind of like, over, not overlook, but we, we, we sort of pretend that the real issue is in there and we focus on the aesthetics. Because what you call aesthetics sometimes is what would determine whether there is, what's the word? Whether whatever you're doing lasts or not. The Tower of Babel was being built. 
And what was going on was rebellion. The angels were concerned about what was going on because we read from the book of Enoch that they went to God and said to God, God, how long are you going to not respond? They said, have you seen? And then they cautioned themselves and said, we know that you have seen what is going on upon the earth. And God was like, uh, keep going. And then they described all of what is going on. But they said, you are the Lord of spirits. We know that you know and nothing is hid from you. But they still came and told him everything again. Does that sound like you and I? Yeah, we know God knows, but we still want to tell him everything. Instead of us to just go and say, Lord, I want you to act on my behalf. But you take God's time and occupy him with relaying to him everything all over again like he doesn't already know. So God stood there and listened to them. And finally, when he was going to respond about the rebellion that was being caused by the fallen angels and their descendants, guess what God's response was? God was like, are they using bricks instead of stone? I mean, if I was the one, I'd be like, that's it, God. I'm going home for the day. We have just brought you a serious matter. You know one of the things that they came to tell God? They told God, they said the fallen ones, the watchers, Azazel, and the rest of them, Samiaza, they have taught the children of men how to make sorcery. They have taught them how to create dye. They're changing the face of the earth. They said, we have looked, and we know you have seen, and the earth does not look like what it used to be. They had all of those concerns. They said they've even had armies that, that have weapons. They're killing each other. If you read the Genesis account, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 10 that men were hunting one another. And so you've read all of that. You've seen all of that. And God's concern was that the, the, the building, they're using bricks instead of stone. It's like, that's gross. And then when he looked close, closer, he said, oh, oh wait a minute. They're even using asphalt instead of mortar. God was like, no, I can't deal with these people. We need to do something about it. There was no mention in his first two or three sentences about the fact that they were in rebellion. That was something that he said after the fact. It was like, oh, by the way, if we keep letting them speak the same language and looking like one another, when they're going to destroy one another. God said, if they continue to be of the same language and of the same speech, the origin of the word speech is the word race or kind, that if they continue to look like one another and speak the same language, they will be one in the flesh. And whatever it is that they imagine to do, where? In the flesh will be possible. And God forbid that we are able to do everything we imagine in the flesh. Do you know how many people would have died on your account just because you were angry that they cut in front of you? Do you know how many people you would have slain if everything you imagine in your flesh is possible? Everybody that stops coming to church for no reason, and you're like, they didn't even tell us they weren't coming anymore. Thunder, where are you? You understand what I mean? So, because they were in the flesh, that is the reason why Jesus was praying to the Father in John 17. He says, Father, make them one as we are one. Because we are not one in the flesh, we are one in the spirit. And so God was like, okay, 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 okay. But don't forget, they did it wrong. They should have used stone and not brick. You see, why is that important to God? I'll tell you why. When he saw that men were erecting altars and they were using bricks instead of stone, he came again and was like, ah, when are these people going to learn? When are they going to change? Why is it important to God? Because when he asked for an altar to be built, he asked for the altar to be built out of stone because he wants an altar that will stand the test of time. Many of us will build our altar out of brick and the moment they give you one hammer of bad news, he breaks your altar and you can no longer praise God when you're unhappy. Let me say that again. You see, bricks, what are bricks? The reason why God really frowns at bricks is because bricks are boring. Every single brick is cut out of the same mold. They all look the same. And God is like, what is the fun in that? Make this thing out of stone. Let it be unique. You know why? When you make it out of bricks, the devil just needs to know how to break one brick and it can break down your entire altar. But when you make it out of stone, every stone is unique. About a year ago, I showed you on the screen the, 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 a picture of the pyramid from above and no two stones look alike. 
And God says, I will build my church out of stones because before he made that statement, he looked at Peter and he called him a stone. You see, because, you know, sometimes Jesus will call him Simon because he was unstable. The word Simon is from the word Shimeon, which means to hear. Up until that time, Peter always went with whatever he heard. Oh, someone is saying that this is happening. Oh, somebody. So he was unstable. He was always going with every wind of doctrine. But the moment he spoke by the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, thou art Peter. Cephas, it means the rock. Petros, rather, it means the rock. He says, if you can be this stable, if you can be a stone like this, that is unique, because you are not just telling what flesh and blood told you. You are not just using a cookie cutter concept of what somebody else done or what somebody else said is what I am saying. No, he says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. Your praise should be like that stone that is not based on how Anita sings at church, how Diamond leads praise, how Ben it plays the keyboard your praise should be unique it should be in a style that heaven does not get from anybody else but you so that when you learn how to praise God like that Satan can come and attack one of your stones but guess what you're still praising God because there are times wherein my voice may have gone from talking all day because for some reason I've just never really been able to get away from talking when, when I'm having business meetings, they don't even let me just show up sometimes and smile. I've got such an amazing smile, but they still want me to talk. You see what I mean? When my wife is done with her day, she wants me to talk. Oh, what did, how did your day go? How was your meeting? I'm like, that meeting, I was talking, and now I still have to talk. You understand what I mean? And so sometimes, sometimes when I don't feel like my voice is up to it, I can still praise God because I know how to hum. I know how to dance. I know how to still scream with a croaky voice simply because no matter what happens, I don't let anyone take down my altar of praise because it has to be perpetual like the pyramid of Giza. I tell you one thing. God knows or God wants you to know that he's about to do a new thing. And whenever God is about to do a new thing, he mostly uses the ministry of his angels. Everyone that God has raised up in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, even in our present day, to do a new thing has experienced a visitation from angels. Even Jesus was perpetually ministered to by angels. And the Bible says, and the angels came and the minister to him. If Jesus needs angels, you need two. In fact, what am I saying? If Jesus needs angels, you need a legion of them. And what do angels need to be able to deliver? They need Bethel. Because they know that they cannot just put the ladder coming from heaven anywhere. Because they need to set up a ladder to go up and down just like they did in the life of Jacob. So how are they going to set up the ladder when you have not given them a position to put the ladder? It's like, inv it's like making an order on Amazon without telling them where you want it to be delivered to. You cannot make a successful order without pinpointing the location of delivery. And praise is that locator that you need because that ladder, do you know Jesus says that that ladder has to be him? He says, I am that ladder. So the angels have to be set up on the word of God that you have. And they can only keep that portal open enough to the extent to which you praise God. So if all of these things have been said to us, then it should be an indicator that God is definitely up to something and he wants me to make room to receive it. When God comes with a reminder word like this about praising him, we need to take it seriously for our own benefit and for the benefit of other people. Now let me show you one more thing and then we're just going to really tap into praise. I want you to come with me to Mark chapter 7. We'll go to Mark chapter 7 and then we'll go back to our Matthew chapter 1. So look at what, in fact, let's do that Matthew chapter 1 first of all. Because... I know that I told you to let that word fester in your spirit. Now, I won't dwell on it too much because we still spoke about this the other day. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 7. All righty, one quick second here. Mark 
Alrighty, so we'll come back to that mark in just a moment. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 1, verse 7. Are we there? I said you should let the name Solomon fester in your spirit. The word Solomon, as you know, is from the word shalom, which means peace. So Solomon means a man of peace or to be peaceful. All right? So in time of war, many people believe that it is okay to be agitated because, I mean, for crying out loud, we're at war. And you know what they say, all this fair in love and war, that's not in the word of God. That is the world. In the time of war, it is not okay for you to be afraid. You know, last week, what did I tell us? I believe it was on Tuesday, that God expects us to be bold before we win, but the world tells you the more you win, the more confident you will be. You know, that's the way of the world. When you write an exam and you pass, you have the confidence to write the next stage of the exam. But God is saying, no, the way things work here is because you're not the one doing the fighting. Heaven is fighting on your behalf because as my wife reminded us, what is one of the names of God? His name is Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. That means he's the Lord of the army of angels. And so if your heavenly father has an army of angels, please, why do you want to go next door to fight all by yourself? Especially when you don't even know the caliber of demon that is bothering your neighbor. You know, sometimes we look at people in the natural and you're like, I can take this person. When your heavenly father says that your weapons of warfare, they're not carnal. You know, sometimes we just feel like, I got this. You know, you, you got nothing. You understand what I mean? Because the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is destruction. Sometimes Satan makes you feel like if you do this to that person, they're going to learn their lesson and they'll respect you next time. And then they stop talking to you. And all you wanted was just to teach them a lesson. You were not even that angry. You're just like, well, the last time I called them, I was telling them all of what was in my heart, and they just hung up and they didn't call me back. So the next time they call me, I went not answer the phone. The first time, the second time. So that they know that I'm an important person. Because if I make myself too available, they take advantage of me. And God is like, is that in the spirit or in the flesh? You understand what I mean? We do things like that all day long. Why? Because of the fact that we have some goals of our own that we want to attain that is other than love. And the Bible says, owe no man nothing. You do not owe anybody a lesson. Owe no man nothing but to love. Your heavenly father is their father. He will teach them by his Holy Spirit. You are not the one that convicts anybody of sin. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts the world of sin and the believer of righteousness. Quit making the Holy Spirit's job your job. Do your job. Your job is to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. God will teach them a lesson. So we have this confidence in our own abilities and the end result is not always great. Sometimes the devil will make it seem like it's working so that you can continue to feel like, yeah, this works. I told you my story when I was in sixth grade. There was a guy that was close to me, but for some reason he always needed me. You know, I don't know what their family situation was, but he always needed me. He needed to borrow a pen. Sometimes he would need an extra, extra uh, booklet to, to take notes and all, what, and all whatnot. At times he would even ask me if I would share my afternoon lunch with him or my snack. And so I, I, after a while, I just felt like the guy needed me. And so whenever he does anything, I would look at him in a certain way just to remind him I'm the pen giver. You know, I wouldn't say it, but I would just give him the, the look. I'm the lunch sharer, you know. If you're not nice to me, I'm not going to share my lunch with you. You know? So I, I got away with it for a very long time. I became so confident in my own ability to lord over the dude. And one day he said something, and I told him off. I went, I overreacted. I was excessive about it because I was so confident in myself. And he was like, I'm sorry. And then he left. So the next day he came, he moved his desk to another part of the classroom. I'm like, until the teacher says, take a note, then he wouldn't have a pen. He would need me. Magically, he had a pen. At lunchtime, he had something to eat. It took only one day for me to recognize that I was not as important as I thought. Eventually, I was the one who went to meet him, and I was like, dude, it wasn't that serious. I was just playing with you. <laughs> because I lost, I lost relevance, because I didn't even have the relevance that I thought I had. 
But the reason why I got to that level was because Satan was making it seem like that so that I would be confident in myself. I learned very quickly that it doesn't work. The Bible says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and it will lift you up. We need to learn how to mind our business, stay in our place and be at peace with people and let God do the dealing with them. So here we are. Solomon, Solomon's name means peaceful. You see, many of us are unaware as we should be of the times that we're in. The happenings in the world today, they are not economical, they are spiritual. On the 28th of February, the Lord reminded us through the ministry of his angels that visited me during worship that it was time for us to start thinking about the things coming out of the world system as artillery against us. Things will be said in the news just so that you can be agitated. I mean, look at what happened a couple of days ago, maybe about a week and a half ago. There was in the news that, oh, President Trump was going to be an, a, a, arrested. Please, when did it become a practice that arrests are announced ahead of time? I'm like, wait a minute. If somebody needs to be arrested, it's not my business. Arrest them. Please, arrest them away. But now they have to be announcing it. He's going to get arrested so that all the people who are his followers and all the people who appreciate him will be agitated. And they are mostly Christians and they lost their peace for those number of days. Somebody called me and was like, oh, have you heard? I said, is Jesus here? <laughs> because that's what I want to hear now, that, that, we're, that we're going home. He said, oh, is Jesus here? No, he said, no, 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 no. They said that President Trump is about to be arrested. So I said to him, I said, don't you think something is fishy here? He said, oh, absolutely. I said, mm, there's a different fish that I am trying to point out. <laughs> Why is it being announced so repeatedly in the news other than to put you in the situation that you're in. Now they've taken your peace. Look at you. You understand what I mean? The devil wants to take your peace. They want to tell you that, oh, the banks are closing down. They're in distress. So that you can begin to look for how to survive. No, I'm already in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that God has given to me everything that pertains to life and godliness. Blessed me with every spiritual blessings. He's not thinking about it. He's not about to do it. The Bible says he has already. If he did not withhold Jesus from me, Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, will he not together with him freely give me all things? Because he is my provider. The things that are happening in the world today are there to test who is wheat different from who is, the, who is a tear because the wheat and the tares are being separated. So everything that you hear, everything that you see is for your sake to show whether you have substance or whether you're just like the ones blown about by the wind. When you hear bad news, do you, do you get weighed down? Do you lose your peace? Or do you recognize that for you, there can never be a bad news? Because the Bible says already in Romans 8, 28, that all things work together. Yes. Do you know what the word all means in English? It means all. Have I said that? Have I said that before? <laughs> Man, Olivia is a good student. Immediately she was like, oh. Yeah. If you're taking notes, please write it down. Okay, I see Olivia is writing it down. The word A-W-L-A-L-L -L -L means all. Simple definition. And, and he says, in Hebrew, it also means oh. If you speak Cantonese, it is oh. And God says all things work together for your good. So how can there be bad news? Can you think about something that is bad news? Because if they say that the banks are all closing down, that's not bad news. It is my time to shine. Because then, maybe some of these unbelievers who thought I was wasting my time serving the God of Israel, serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all those people who think I'm wasting my time calling upon the name of the Lord, morning, afternoon, night, and you know, they think, oh, you're doing too much. Maybe it's time for them to recognize that he is also Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, my provider. You see, when the economy goes in distress... And I'm building a house that is bigger than the one that I'm living in now. Maybe that's why they'll come to me and say, dude, I'll be like, to you is royalty. You can't call me dude no more. Because you don't have money, but I have Jesus. 
You understand what I mean? The Bible says that darkness will cover the earth and gross darkness to people. Why? So that your little light can seem like a floodlight. If darkness doesn't come, nobody cares if you have light or not. If everybody has light. You understand what I mean? When we were children, growing up in Nigeria, we suffered outages all the time. Sometimes like multiple times in a week. Five minutes, ten minutes. In fact, sometimes almost like the whole day. You don't have power. But if you have a little generator, you don't have an enemy on the entire street. Everyone is your friend. If you are that house with a generator where other people can go and watch the news, where they can go and have a little bit of light to iron their clothes, let me tell you something, no matter what you do to your neighbors, they're always like, wow, you're so amazing. You're awesome. Simply because when darkness comes, you are the light. The Bible says Gentiles will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your shining. But all of that is only going to happen after darkness has covered the earth. So please, can you imagine something that for you can constitute bad news? The word of God says there is none. That was why when Jesus was leaving, he only told his disciples to tell the world one thing. He says, go and go into all the world and preach the gospel. The gospel is what? Good news. That I have come, I have taken care of everything. It is finished. Just come and let them know. And that was the reason why they were persecuted and killed because the world did not want anybody to know that they're free. <laughs> anyway, let's go back to Matthew chapter 1 verse 7. And Solomon gave birth to who? Rehoboam. And Rehoboam gave birth to Abijah. And Abijah gave birth to Asa. The word Solomon means what? It means peaceful because it's from what? It's from the word shalom. When you are at peace, it will give birth to Rehoboam. Rehoboam means the one that enlarges me. So when I'm at peace, I am confident that if I need to increase and be more in my health, if I need to be at if I need to increase in my finances, if I need to increase in my love for people, if I need to increase in my patience with others, the Lord is the one that will do it, not me. The reason why we lose our peace is because we think that we have to do it when God says, I'm the one who enlarges you. So the word of the Lord to you today, and I'm glad that my wife and Alan set us up with the word on praise because by praise, what happens is you create an atmosphere of the presence of God. And when God is present, guess what? You have peace. My wife read to us on the account of David. The Bible says the moment David went to retrieve the Ark of the Covenant from the house of that faithful man called Obed-Edom and brought it to his house, God gave him peace all around. And that was why he had a child and called the child Solomon because there was just so much peace they didn't know what to do with themselves and God says don't worry about it it's not just you your generations after you there will always be a man on the throne and so you're about to secure for yourself a strategy to immune your posterity to defeat posterity is your lineage it's different from prosperity but you want your posterity to be in prosperity so you need to cultivate that because when you have the presence of God, you have what? You have peace. Why is it so? You see, it's one thing to have God's presence, but it's another thing for you to have a presence of God that is actively moving. When you have the presence of God that is actively moving, what that looks like is this. When you have the presence of God because you're, you've, you've created an atmosphere of worship, and then you also start to praise God for what he hasn't already done. Do you know that you can praise God to the point wherein God begins to dance? How did you learn how to dance? You think you learned it from the club? No, God invented dancing. People have been dancing before they were night clubs. You understand what I mean? But guess what? Some of us, the moment we get born again, we lose dancing. Well, I go dancing is for the world. No, the world did not invent anything. Anything that you were once doing in the world is only an, uh, 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 an adulteration of something that God originally intended. So if you used to be high in the world, be high on the Holy Spirit. If you used to dance from morning till night, dance when you come to the presence of God. If you used to have the confidence, let me speak to the men in the room, the confidence to go and talk to that girl that you've never met before. You know how you see a girl that you've never met before and you're going to walk up to her and say, hey, how are you doing? You should be that confident. 
to talk to people about Jesus. We get born again and we suddenly become shy. We suddenly lose our social skills. No, you need to learn how to be able to use all of that for the sake of the gospel because it was given to you. Remember, you are the planting of the Lord that you might be glorified, that he might be glorified. And so you need to learn how to create that atmosphere. And when you begin to sing and dance before the Lord, he rejoices over you. That's what the Bible says. The way you rejoice at him is the way he rejoices at you. And when God gets up, the Bible says his enemies will scatter. You have an incentive to create an atmosphere of praise that could potentially make God get up on your behalf to do a little dance. You know what happens? Solomon, when he was growing up, he was watching David. So he learned that if you want God to show up, praise him. So he, he slaughtered a thousand bulls because he knows people like food. So when people heard that the king had just slaughtered a thousand cows or bulls, guess what happened? Everybody showed up. And the moment they were fed, it was like, now begin to sing. So you had the most crowd. It was a big concert. The people were fed and they were singing like crazy. And they created such an atmosphere of God's presence that God had no choice but to show up and ask Solomon that same night, what do you want? People don't just do things for nothing. Praise God to the point wherein God is like, wait a minute, I've, has he received all of what he asked for? Or is he just praising by faith? You understand what I mean? Praise God as though you already have it. That's what Jesus said. He said, whatsoever you ask the Father, believe that you have received and then give thanks. They didn't teach us that well enough, at least in my own situation, they didn't teach us well enough how it works. They told us, and so we did it mechanically. And to do it mechanically is, okay, I've already asked God that God, please, I want that 101 acres of land so that I can grow those crops that you told me to grow. And so now I'm just going to thank you. Oh, thank you because I know you've done it. No, that's not how it works. Jesus did not just say, ask him and thank him. He says, believe that you have received it. You see, the moment you believe it enough, guess what? You will have peace. You will have joy. You will start to Develop joy from the inside as though you have already received it. So your thanksgiving will be organic and genuine. You see, God knows all of our theatrics. Because sometimes, we, let me, let's be honest, we've done it, right? We've done this before where we're just like, because the word of God says to give thanks. Father, I thank you because I'm healed. I thank you because I'm healed. But you're, you're not feeling thankful. You're just trying to check a box. Don't go from asking to thanking. Believe, first of all, that you have received. Because the moment you believe that you have received, even if you still feel the headache, the emotion of joy will overshadow the feeling of pain and your praise will be a genuine praise. And God will rise up on your behalf and your enemies be scattered. So let's wrap it up very quickly. Solomon gave birth to, the, the, to Rehoboam, which means the Lord is the one that enlarges me so I don't have to worry. And then Rehoboam gave birth to who? Gave birth to Abijah or Abijah. You know what Abijah means? Abi, from the word Abba, from the word Father. He says Jehovah, Abijah, Jehovah. Jehovah is my father. You see, when you're at peace, and you recognize that God is the one that will take care of everything, you begin to walk around as though God is your father. Let me, let me explain that once again. To, you know, I've told you sometimes when I have a dream that I don't like, I used to pray in the past and be binding and losing. I say, oh, I don't like that dream. But after a while, I'm like, I am not afraid. What can man do unto me? So when I have a dream that I don't like, I'm like, okay, so am I praying because I'm afraid? No, anything that I do out of fear, God does not recognize it. The Bible says in Hebrews that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Two days ago, I woke up in the middle of the night from a nasty dream. And I was like, wow, if I spend any more time thinking about that dream, I am rubbing myself of sleep. So I just rolled over to the other side and I kept sleeping. And then I went into the most amazing dream. If I, when I woke up, I got angry. I'm like, whoever wakes up from this kind of dream, is too good. I'm telling you. But you know what? Instead of, if, if I had stayed up worrying about the bad dream, I would have lost sleep. And the Bible says, God, God spoke. He says, I give to my beloved in sleep. Most of the translations that we read says the Lord gives to his beloved sleep. If you look at the original Hebrew text, it says the Lord gives to his beloved in sleep. So God wants to give you stuff, but you're not peaceful. 
God wants to bless you, but you're too busy trying to make it happen on your own. And God is like, when you're done trying, I will come. When God came to Solomon, was he when Solomon was walking around inspecting his horses? Was he when he was trying to decide if he was going to marry the 700th wife or not? No. God came to Solomon when he was asleep. The Bible says after all that conversation with God, asking for wisdom and understanding, the man Solomon woke up. God wants to give to you in your sleep. So don't let one bad dream is a test to see whether you believe that your God is the enlarger. Do you truly believe that your God is with you? Do you truly believe? Because if you believe, I am his beloved. Will someone come and drag me out of sleep to somewhere that I don't want to go? No, it's not going to happen because I'm under the shadow of the almighty God. And so if it's a bad dream and I don't like it, it's an illusion. Because at the end of the day, everything works together for my good. You know what I mean? There are things that have happened to me that should have taken me out, but because of the revelation that I have of the love of God, guess what? I was happy because I'm like, now the enemy thinks they got me. So they are going to lower their defenses because they think they have the upper hand, which will make the next blow coming from heaven be worse. There are so many stories like that in the Bible. You see, the Bible says that if the king, if the prince of this world had known, he would not have slain the Lord of glory. Do you know why Jesus was able to spoil all principalities and powers when he went to hell? One location, all principalities and powers. Because Satan sent an invitation to all his goons, says we got him. When Jesus was slain on the cross, and they were like, wait a minute, we saw him on the cross. And we saw that the father made him sin. So he's not going to heaven. He's coming to hell because he is sin. The Bible says he who knew no sin was made sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus was not made a sinner. It was, not, it was impossible to make someone who did not sin a sinner. The Bible did not say Jesus was made a sinner. No, he was made sin, the embodiment of sin itself. And so Satan was like, he sent messages to all the principalities and powers. He was like, we got him. So they all came to watch Jesus in hell, but it was a setup. The Bible says, having gone deep down into hell, he spoiled all principalities and power. To spoil does not mean to slap people's faces. To spoil means to say to them, okay, I'm taking all of that. You take their spoil. So he stripped them of all of the power that they were operating with. And that's the reason why he says, all power has been given to me, and now I give you the authority to wield that power. So sometimes when the devil thinks he's getting the best of you, rejoice because now they're, gonna, they, they, they're setting themselves up. Now what came out of Abijah or Abijah, what came out of Abijah was what? Asa. And the word Asa, as short as it is, it means the Lord is my healer. It's literally what it means, it means the one who cures. So now, the beauty of the life of a peaceful man is not only does he have his life enlarged, not only does he stand confident that Jehovah is his God, all of the beating that he took while he was waiting for the blessing, there will be no trace of it because of the Lord, my Asa. The Lord will kill you of all of what's happened to you. Let me say that again very slowly. Do you know that some of us in the course of waiting for our big blessing to arrive, certain things have come and damaged your credit? Not just your credit with FICO, but your credibility with people. Some people no longer trust that you can deliver at your word because like, <laughs> the last time he said he was going to do that, he didn't do it. He said he was going to pay us, he didn't pay us. He said he was going to build this thing, he didn't build it. You see, when the Lord, your Asa comes, the Bible says he will cure you of every stigma. It will wipe away your tears and you will remember your sorrow no more. You're not the only one that will not remember your sorrow. Other people will begin to think that they are imagining that you were once broke. They'll be like, is it the same Alan that we used to know? No, it's not the same. He's a new man. While you were busy backbiting, the Lord was promoting him. And all of that came out of what? Being peaceful. Let your Solomon give birth to Rehoboam. Let Rehoboam give birth to Abijah. Don't abort the process because the blessing of God has to get to that third and fourth generation. All of what God is doing is he wants to heal you and kill you of every disease so that you become that light that is shining. An example to other believers of what it means to be a lover of Jesus and a follower of God, a friend of the Holy Spirit. I want to encourage you 
praise God always and be at peace always. We're going to break bread in just a minute. I see Alan already giving out the communion. Thank you for being in the spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because sometimes if I don't see the communion being given, I think it's still 7 p.m. and I want to keep going. God is good. So, um, how many people were prayed for on Tuesday? Praise the Lord. Anybody already seeing, or you're already feeling the, the effect of the prayer? God is good. I told you in the times that we're in, please do not mistake the times that we're in from the times that we were coming from. The times that we were coming from, we used to have to wait for certain things to happen, but in the times that we're in, a lot of our blessings, miracles, and wonders are happening more readily, more quickly. So don't you be sitting there saying, remember that when John's father came here two Saturdays ago and the Lord gave me a word because I saw a little girl standing in front of him and he prayed and she was delivered of evil spirits. That was about maybe nine o'clock or so. By 11 p.m., they called him a strange person that he has never really spoken to on those matters before, called him and his first question was like, how did you even know that I'm a Christian and that I can pray? Why did you people call me? They were like, we don't know anyone else to call. We just knew that we needed to call you that our child is punching through the wall, removing the door. The same night, he prayed for the girl and by the next time they saw the girl, she was fully delivered with a testimony of peace. So, let us recognize, praise the Lord, the times that we are in. It doesn't have to take forever. That doesn't mean you should not be patient, but it means you need to be expectant. You understand what I mean? I am patient, but I am highly expectant. Praise the Lord. God is good. Alrighty, so let's break bread with a scripture from the book of Isaiah. You see that Isaiah 19 that we read? We didn't read verse 18. So let's just quickly read that verse 18 and use it as our communion scripture today. The Lord has an altar. Let's say together that the Lord has an altar that is set up on the earth to keep him in remembrance of me. And so I need to have an altar in heavenly places to keep me in remembrance of him. And that altar is the man Christ who is seated at the right hand of the Father. So as we break bread today, the Bible says, as often as you have the opportunity to do this in remembrance of me, we do this because this is again an altar. When we break bread, we're doing it in remembrance of him. And guess what happens? When you remember him and he remembers you, it is heaven on earth. It's Isaiah chapter 19, I mean, I said it is heaven on earth. Be expectant. Heaven on earth means righteousness, peace, and joy. So the Bible says in Isaiah 19, 18, uh, if I, I want to read 17 very quickly, it says, and the land of Judah will be a terror to Egypt. Everyone who makes mention of it will be afraid in himself because the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he has determined against it. Everything that has been a terror to you in this life, you will be a terror to that's what the Lord says. The Bible says <laughs> that the people of God, they will be a terror to Egypt. You see, I haven't, I, I, we've started talking about this, but I, I hope in the next couple of meetings, I'll be able to break it down to you some more. The Lord is doing a great thing upon the earth. The shaking that is going up, going on in the earth today is to clear the wicked people out of the way so that you and I can truly and genuinely inherit the earth and enjoy the goodness of it. So when you see all of these things, God is using the wicked to fight one another. Uh, let me tell you something. You know, in the past, we used to think in countries. We used to think, well, I belong to this country, I belong to that country. But now what we're seeing is, is gone beyond the level of countries. We're seeing forces of people gathered together. Even though they come from this country and that country, the people that are in that country may not necessarily agree with them, but they're acting on their own because there is another agenda. And that is the reason why, like I told you, the two warring kings now, their names means more than just one king. You know that the name of the two warring kings is assigned to us as believers. One of them is called Volodymyr Zelensky, and the other one is called Vladimir Putin. 
The word Volodymyr and Vladimir mean the same thing because they're from the same language, just different dialects. And what does Volodymyr or Vladimir, what does it mean? It means the rulers of the world. So each one of them represents a faction of a ruler of the world. And so what's going to happen is you would not have to lift a finger where in the time of Exodus 14, 14, the Lord reminded me of that as we were driving to church, a time wherein the Lord says, do nothing, I will fight for you. Because if you need, you want to fight, what can you fight? Can you fight the IRS? Can you fight China? Can you fight inflation? What can you fight? No, we're not supposed to hear that and feel powerless. We're supposed to hear that and elevate. I may not be able to fight them, but guess what? The one who is called the head of principalities and powers is with me and I am in him so I can fight in the realm of the spirit and address the forces of the darkness of this age. You understand what I mean? And so once I do it in the realm of the spirit, I don't have to do anything in the natural. I don't have to sign a petition. I don't even have to launch a campaign simply because I've taken care of the things that are behind the people. The forces that are behind the people have been taken care of. Operate these principles, I beg you, so that you can be at peace, so that you can feel powerful because if you want to fight the system of this world, you will be like a grasshopper in their sight because they invented the game so that no matter what you do, they can always change the rules and win over you. So you can't fight in their own game. You can't be in the flesh. You have to be in the spirit. So very good. Now, verse 17, the Bible says, and the land of Judah will be a terror to the system. What is the land of Judah? Judah means praise. When you are in the land of Judah, what that means is you are always standing in praise. Everywhere that you walk to, you take Judah with you. You take praise with you. When you live like that, the enemy will not be a terror to you, but you will be a terror to it. You are a dangerous person to the kingdom of darkness if you praise God all the time. Because the devil will wait for you sometimes to be unhappy because things are not working so that he can suck more of your joy and make you feel frustrated. Do you know how disappointing it is for heaven for you to sit down for five minutes sad? The same you that Jesus died for? When you think about it, you are a child of God. You are the inheritor of the earth because you are an heir of salvation together with Christ Jesus. Please, why should the devil have a whole five minutes of your peace? Jesus paid for that peace with his, with his blood. He paid for your joy with his own soul. Don't let the devil take it. These things are too precious. They may take your money, but they can't take your joy. And as long as you have that joy intact, you will have what money cannot even buy. Verse 18 says, in fact, let's stop at verse 17 so that we can break bread. Otherwise, we'll be here till tomorrow. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the heart of praise. We thank you because you have given us the garment of praise in place of the spirit of heaviness. That we may declare your goodness in the land of the living. Father, in Jesus' name, everyone that is here today is at your feet. We are in your presence because your presence is here. Lord, let the reality of what is in your presence and what your presence is, let it dawn on every one of us that is in here today, that we might receive that divine insight to press more into what you have for us, that we may come out of here taking with us a portion and a measure of your presence as the Ark of the Covenant was taken from the house of Obed-Edom to the house of David, so that we will take your presence with us as we go home to have fellowship with you all the days of our lives. And as often as we do this, Lord, we do it in remembrance of you that you may be glorified. So let us eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. In Jesus' name, amen. If the person beside you did not take the communion, can you just ask them and say, why not? You don't have to be good to take it. When you take it, it makes you good. You don't have to be, you don't have to be righteous. If you're already righteous, why do you need the blood of Jesus? There's no righteousness outside the blood. The Bible says there is no atonement for sin outside of the blood. Without the, remi without the shedding of blood, thank you, sir, there is no remission of sins. So I encourage everybody around you, take it. You need it to be where you need to be. Praise the Lord. I'm going to say one more thing, and Alan is going to come and close out the service for us. But I just want to say this. I want to encourage you. 
as soon as you are beginning to act to attain the things that have been promised. As soon as you see the unfolding of these miracles, share it with somebody. You understand what I mean? As soon as it happens, don't delay. You understand what I mean? Pass it on because that joy is going to be a booster for somebody else. Earlier in the week, as soon as Kayla got, you know, her new position fully confirmed, she sent me a text. She was like, it is done. You don't even know what that text message did for me. All that emoji that I was sending you did not do anything. Because I was at a time wherein we had just received an update in business. And I'm like, okay, how long is it going to take from here to there? So when I got your message, I'm like, oh, we're in a season of, pe of speed. I don't have to worry about it. It is already done. Yes, because we overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the words of our testimony. Let your testimony be someone else's booster rocket. God bless you. God is good. Hallelujah. Give God praise. Come on, come on. Joshua, if you help us with the uh, offering slide. Thank you, sir. Glory to God. God is so good. I want to um, I just encourage us in this, you know, as the Lord has dealt with us on the power of the altar, of creating that thing and walking in praise uh, you know, these are, these are secrets that are being revealed unto us plainly, you see. And um, as we are preparing to give, I have a prayer for us all that bless me. Um, you see, sometimes we don't realize the things that we have forgotten about, that we've done, led of the Holy Ghost to this person or that person, got them a cup of coffee or gave them a this thing or that thing, how much heaven weighs that act of good, you see. And what the Lord revealed to me recently, um, I went into a dream where the Lord showed me the faces of men and the dollar value that I had put over that action and how much heaven had increased over that or how much the uh, uh, heaven uh, uh, put stock on that thing that I had done. For example, I saw a couple of dollars over the face of a man and saw that heaven had ranked that thing well over 20,000, you see. And so I want us to catch a revelation because it'll lift us in our faith if we can just get a glimpse into those things that we have done, that the Lord has been encouraging us to do. And so that's my prayer for us tonight over us is that the Lord will allow us to see those things that he has smiled upon us on that we didn't even know. We were just moving by the Holy Ghost. Lord, this is what you asked me to do, and I'm going to do it. And it'll be such a booster to our faith because what has all this encouragement been tonight for us to move in the good works to do? What do we say? Much of our ministry ain't even from the pulpit. It's in our relationship, in our day-to-day, -day, how we handling our brothers and sisters. We give God praise. The offering slide is on the screen to our family online. We have several ways to give. Online, communion.house slash give at Communion House on Cash App and PayPal. I want us to give us, for I want to give us a couple of seconds, just prepare that see because we know it is unto us as the word has declared and promised us to give the tenth part to test the Lord in it and see if he will not open the floodgates of heaven, the storehouses of heaven, that we don't have room enough to receive that blessing. So let's give in faith tonight. Father, we give you praise. And with that seed prepared, Lord, we say unto you that there is none like you, O creator of heaven and of earth. For indeed you sent your son and he descended and ascended, O God, back unto you. We say that all glory belong to you. We thank you for this season, O oh God, where we see the manifestation of everything that you have promised us, O oh God, for we see it by faith upon the horizon, even as the man of God has declared that that blessing, O oh God, is upon our doorstep. Lord, we give in faith. We give in honoring your name. We give, O oh God, in offering. And we ask of thee, let these offerings, let these tithes, O oh God, be found pleasing in your sight. Let them be sweet smelling unto you. 
we declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And everyone said, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a night tonight. Let's give the Lord praise for what he's done. Hallelujah. Y'all know this live stream will be available tomorrow evening around 7 p.m., so please tap into that. We want, oh, 6. Thank you, sir. 6 p.m. tomorrow evening. Press into that. Share this word because we know these words that we've been receiving this past month especially have just been so plain. You know, it's not much you got to break down. The Lord has just given it to us as is, and there's so many that can benefit, okay, from this word. So we give God praise. Make sure you share it, like it, share the page because a lot, you don't know how many you're touching, you know. When you have that encounter with the Holy Ghost, so many has received, as I've prayed that we experience those dreams for the Lord to bring to our members those things that we've done. We don't know how just sharing, how many that can bring into understanding and to that encounter that they need to have just by hearing the word of God. So we give God praise. Father, we thank you again for this evening that you have moved mightily in our midst. You have revealed mysteries unto us, O God, and have ministered your word, that truth. O God, we thank you for the Holy Ghost that leads us into all truth. We thank you, O God, that we indeed shall carry this presence home into our households, O God, and those that are around us that you have called us to minister to shall receive from it. They shall drink from it. They shall partake from it, O God, and be blessed. All glory and honor belong to you. Amen, and so be it. Everyone have a blessed night.